Is this better? Once again, my name is Tope Polar, and I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Studies. I'd like to welcome all of you who are here. And those of you who are online, we are so excited to be hosting this conversation. Um, IPS has been around for 60 years. We turned 60 this year. And throughout that entire time, we've been supporting social movements in a variety of ways. Uh, we provide research, analysis, and writing. And we also help to develop ideas that power social movements as well. Uh, so if you want to learn more about IPS, please stay around after the talk or get on our website, ips-dc.org, to learn more about IPS. Um, we've also been a longtime supporter of Cuba, and so that's one reason why we're so excited to be hosting this conversation today. Uh, I hear the Deputy Foreign Affairs Secretary used to spend time at IPS back in the day uh, interacting with Saul Landau, who's our former and beloved fellow who passed away a few years ago. So. We're happy to be continuing that conversation, continuing that relationship. Uh, and this for us is a really exciting moment. So thank you all for coming. And those of you who are online, thank you for, for tuning in as well. And I'll pass the mic back to James. Good afternoon. Multi-decade member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, stating way back sometimes in the last century, the last millennium almost. Um, I, I'm really pleased that we are having this opportunity to have an engagement um, with the Deputy Foreign Minister, um, Carlos Fernandez de Cosio, who is under a lot of time challenges as we witness now, uh, waiting on his arrival. Unfortunately, uh, he is, we're gonna have a hard stop at around 4.30. Uh, this is the period of the annual meeting of the United Nations. And so that a lot is going on with regard to Cuba and various meetings. And um, it's going to be somewhat frustrating because we will not be able to have the full engagement that this audience, both uh, in situ and the audience online deserves. Um, there are people from broad um, areas of interest in Latin America and the Caribbean and particularly US policy towards Cuba here today. Uh, before um, I acknowledge our co-sponsors, I do wanna acknowledge the, the presence of Ambassador Francisco Campbell from Nicaragua. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the co-sponsors that um, are collaborating with IPS uh, in this dialogue on prospects of normalization of relations between uh, Cuba and the United States. And I'll say more about why that topic uh, is the framework for today's engagement. Uh, amongst the uh, co-sponsors are the, Washington, uh, uh, the Latin American Working Group, uh, the Friends of Latin America, uh, Black Alliance uh, for Peace, um, ACERE, uh, Alliance for Engagement and Respect for Cuba. I'm a member of that advisory board. Uh, Code Pink. Uh, I don't think I've left anybody out, but I do want to give a special acknowledgement and shout out to the events coordinator here at the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, Netfer Freeman, both for the inReach and uh, gathering the uh, IPS family together, as well as for his work uh, with the Cuban embassy and the outreach uh, to audiences here in, the United, in, in Washington and across the United States who are uh, online. Sal Landau's name has been mentioned most significantly. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that name. Can I see a raise of hands? That's a very good sign. Uh, it's a name uh, with regard to the Institute for Policy Studies and the history of relations, particularly with the Cuban Revolution, which uh, I would urge us all old veterans as well as uh, new citizen advocates and activists to revisit. Uh, Sal Landau was a stellar example of the relationship of a respectful engagement with Cuba. I see that our visitors will be entering shortly. Uh, I would urge you to go back and look at both his writings around Cuba, 
in my very idealistic days and before maturity took over, uh, I began to realize that Sal Landau's voice may have been uh, perhaps the most important public space voice of engaging uh, what was going on in Cuba in very honest terms. And it was one that uh, illustrated when we talk about respectful relations, it was not a question of whether Cuba agreed with him or not, it was that they understood that he was earnest and respectful. Um, look at his work, um, he brought really Fidel Castro uh, to the screen, I think around, uh, I have to look at my notes here, 1988. Uh, look at his uh, last work with one of our Board of Trustees members, um, Danny Glover, uh, Will the Real Terrorists Please Stand, uh, which was about the Cuban Five. And I would urge uh, both we veterans as well as uh, we newer generations, uh, both in citizen advocacy here at IPS and outside, to revisit his writings uh, because it is a really uh, excellent illustration of what a respectful engagement uh, on the part of the United States citizenry and on the part of the United States government should be. Uh, today's topic. Um, uh, yes, my apologies, please. Okay, how's this? Great, well, it's really an honor to be here and to have everybody want to steal the thunder. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just really quickly, um, I'm here to announce and invite everybody to IPS's 47th annual Lotelier Moffitt Human Rights Award. And if you don't know, every year, um, IPS gives out a human rights award to honor the assassination of Orlando Lotelier and Ronnie Carpet Moffitt, who were assassinated by the Pinochet dictatorship, actually carried out by three anti-Castro Cuban exiles. And so we honor their memory by celebrating upcoming sort of unsung champions of human rights. So this year we'll be giving out a domestic award to Black and Pink, a Black trans abolitionist group, and our international awardee is Tutela Legal, a group of leading lawyers in El Salvador who are fighting mass incarceration and the state of emergency there. So I really hope you guys can all join us. It's on October 12th. And if you're interested in more information, there are these flyers on the table over there and you can always come and find me. So thank you. Please welcome and acknowledge the president of uh, the Cuban ambassador to the United States, uh, Lillian Doris. Ah, here we are. And of course, our dear friend and longtime uh, colleague, uh, Carlos Fernandez de uh, Cosillo, the deputy foreign minister of Cuba who has a very distinguished career in which I will not uh, cite all of it, except to mention a few key points of his longstanding public service uh, in the Republic, the Socialist Republic of Cuba, as ambassador to Canada, uh, ambassador to South Africa, and a number of other Southern African uh, countries, and a very important uh, interlocutor uh, in Latin America as a zone of peace, the Caribbean and Latin America is a zone of peace, uh, which is uh, exemplified uh, in the central role uh, that the Cuban people and the Cuban government have played in the resolution of the long-standing civil war within Colombia, uh, for which Cuba is uh, ostensibly being punished uh, as a being on the on the list of uh, terrorist states, uh, a farce. Uh, but an important point for us to remember. Uh, as we take up this issue of the prospects for the normalization of relations. Uh, we are on a strict time schedule, so I'm just going to make a few more brief comments uh, on the nature of uh, our dialogue today, uh, the prospects for normalization of relations with Cuba. 
when the co-sponsors came together and uh, with Ned Freeman, the events coordinator here at IPS and asked my views about this, uh, I agreed that this framework is the high watermark over the last 60 years, a normalization of relations, which we here in the United States have a somewhat chauvinistic tendency to talk about how President Barack Obama opened up relations with Cuba. But a respectful engagement and a normalization of relations is a reflection of relations between two governments representing two different nations. This agreement was an agreement between the administration of President Barack Obama and President Raul Castro. Very important uh, for us to understand that this was a negotiated development, uh, one of respect, and it is the high water mark uh, that was pushed back under the Trump administration and in many ways has been intensified uh, under the administration of uh, Biden and Harris. And so that is a mark in uh, looking at now, what are the prospects uh, for us redeveloping from that foundational base uh, that uh, those two administrations developed? And without further ado, I turn it over uh, to the Deputy Foreign Minister of Cuba. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much and good afternoon to all of you. I, I hope what we have is a conversation in which we engage with inputs and questions from, from both sides, but I'll start with a, with a few remarks. Most of you know, most of you that are engaged with Cuba, that we frequently engage with Americans of different delegations or different origins when they come to Cuba or even in the United States to talk about our, our two countries, about our relationship, and many times just to explain about Cuba, what's the reality in Cuba. We also do so with Europeans and Latin Americans and Africans that visit Cuba. They, they ask us, they have a keen un, uh, interest in trying to understand the relationship between US and Cuba. And one of the most common questions posed to us by Cubans in our country by foreigners and interestingly by Americans is that given that Joe Biden was a vice president of Barack Obama, what explains that he, instead of implementing the policy towards Cuba of Obama, he is implementing faithfully the policy of Donald Trump. And truly we don't have an answer or a clear answer for that. Maybe we're not familiar enough with US politics and, and realities in this country, but it is a riddle for us. And, but it's not strange as a question because we could also ask, why does the United States keep Cuba in the State Department list of countries that allegedly sponsor terrorism when there's no foundation for it, when there's no argument to sustain that allegation. They know that the presence of Cuba in that list has an important impact, that the people of Cuba are hurting because of that, that the Cuban economy has an additional burden to the one imposed already by the economic blockade, that this has an impact in the standard of living in the welfare of the people of Cuba, in their ability to, to, to have better income for healthcare, for education, even to obtain food. And we read and we see that it is constantly said by US politicians that the number one responsibility of the US government is to protect the safety of Americans. And we don't, we don't argue with that. So the question that from Cuba we ask, how is the safety and the security of Americans protected by making people in Cuba hurt, by depressing the standard of living of Cubans, by making life as unbearable as possible, which is the aim of the policy for Cubans? And again, we don't have an answer for that. 
maybe someone here would have it. We don't have it. We also ask, what explains that the United States established against Cuba a policy which normally what we think it's a wartime policy, which is to try to deprive Cuba from the supply of fuel, a country that depends on the import of fuel for functioning, for everything, from, from moving, from transportation to electricity, to the production of food, to the production of anything, to, to electricity in your home, for running hospitals, schools, everything. How are Americans protected? Or what interest, how is the welfare of Americans improve? How does it improve? by depriving Cuba of fuel? How are Americans more safe? How are they safer from terrorism by depriving Cuba from fuel? Or how are Americans better off by chasing Cuban medical cooperation around the world, by depriving Central Americans, Latin Americans, Caribbean, Africans, and Asians from the services that Cuban doctors are ready to provide and have provided and have proven to have had an impact for the better in the standards of health of many countries around the world for the past 50 to 60 years. How are Americans benefited from carrying out that, that those are chasing and that going after Cuban medical cooperation around the world? All these questions are difficult for us to answer. But what we do know is that the policy of the United States, and I'm just singling out a few things of a very comprehensive policy of economic coercive measures make, aimed at making life difficult for Cuba and depressing the Cuban economy. All of this has an impact. Impact that is seen on daily life. And I'll give you an example. Cuba, Cuba has developed the capacity on its own to produce from 70 to 80% of the drugs that one needs for our health system. The ones that people take normally for chronic diseases, but also for the drugs that are used in sensitive care in hospitals and et cetera. But today, the people of Cuba are having huge limitations to acquire those drugs because it's become, it has become difficult for us to find the raw materials and the inputs that we need for that industry or the equipment or the updating of the equipment that we need for that. And all this is a result of closing of financial institutions that used to provide us or companies that used to provide some of these drugs to Cuba or the raw material for the drugs, but now refuse to do so because Cuba allegedly is a sponsor of terrorism. And they say, we don't believe that Cuba is, but I might suffer consequences if I deal with you because I, either have business or would like to have business in the United States or have business with people that have business in the United States. So it has an, it has an, an implication in the food availability. <clears throat> if one looks at ECLAC, Commission, Economic Commission for Latin America, one could see that from 1960 on, with the exception of the 1990s, the Cuban intake average intake of protein, carbohydrates, and basic foods was superior to any country in Latin America. That the intake of milk of a child in Cuba has been superior to any child in Latin America in the Caribbean, even though the blockade exists since the beginning of the 1960s. That is changing in Cuba today. The intake of protein and carbohydrates, including milk in Cuba, has been depressed for the first time <laughs> since the beginning of the revolution. So we have it in medicine, you have it in food intake, you have it in transportation, you have it in the availability of electricity, you have it in education to secure the materials that you need to repair the schools, to maintain. How does the American national security enhance itself by carrying out this policy toward uh, Cuba? And we tend to think that there's a dub, double purpose here. We are told that is because of politics. Officially, we're told that is because of politics, whatever that means in the US. 
what we see, one is there continues to be a purpose of regime change. It's an effort to overthrow the Cuban government because it's not liked in Washington. I'm not saying it's not liked by Americans, even though the policy is applied on behalf of all of you, you know, of all Americans, but that is an aim. And there's another aim that perhaps is not shared by everybody, but there are people in the United States who share that aim that do not want the example of a small developing country to have the capability of providing quality public health care for free and accessible to the whole of the population. That success story or accessible quality education or a capacity of scientific research and development capable of having developed two vaccines, one of the few countries that developed successful vaccines to combat COVID. And that example is not like, as there is a dislike for the capacity of a small developing country to provide aid in significant capacity in Central America, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Africa, with thousands of engineers, basically doctors, technicians, sports trainers, teachers that have been recognized by several secretary generals of the United Nations, by several director generals of ECLAC, which is the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, by personalities all over the world, including a former president of the United States who acknowledged this possibility. And that's the second aim that we believe exists. Our approach as a nation could be surprising to many. Because for anyone who study international relations, they would ask, what's the normal response of any country that has a piece of its territory occupied by a foreign power against the will of the country? Which is the response of a country that suffers a policy aimed at making its population as a whole, not a segment of the population, the population as a whole suffer? Because it's, it's a trick to Americans when politicians say, we're, we're targeting a so-called elite or the government. The target is the people of Cuba. The whole people of Cuba is the victim and the target of this policy. What is the attitude of a country that does that? Would that country be ready to continue to have diplomatic relations? Would that country be ready to engage? And I can tell you, because we are responsible for that, that the official policy and the, and, and, and the approach that we take as a country is that we need to engage with the United States. We want a respectful and peaceful relationship with the United States. We want to engage with them as many Americans as possible from all walks of life, regardless of their ideological, religious, cultural, economic background. Our aim is to try to extend links because we are neighbors as countries and we need to engage. And if one looks at Cuba's history of the past 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50 years, Cuba has successful bilateral relationships with almost every country in the world. Friendly, I would say, with most of them and cooperation with the majority of them. We have never had as an obstacle, an ideological difference, a political difference, an economic difference. Our approach as a nation is to engage with the many countries in the world. And that includes the United States in spite of the fact that we are victims of an unrelented, unrelenting economic war that is accompanied by a budget of 30, $40 million approved by the US Congress every year to try to change, to politically influence Cuba, 
to pay for people in Cuba, to buy positions of Cuba within Cuba, and people outside, outside of Cuba to act against our country, from the United States, from Europe, from countries in Latin America. That is a policy we have in place, and it's a reality that we have. Cuba today is a country, I would say, in transformation. In economic terms, we've we are introducing, we've been introducing in the past few years, uh, more transformations in the social economic landscape than ever since the 1960s. By our own design, not because we were forced to do that, because we need, we, we, we concluded that we need to update the kind of model that we're following to continue to ensure a system of social justice equity, sustainable development for the future. And for that, we need to transform. We've had strong discussions and we could have chosen. We're undergoing difficult economic moments. Let's postpone this. And rightly or wrongly, we chose, we'll continue to introduce these transformations in spite of the critical moment uh, which we're facing at this time. And it's become very difficult because some of the things we have to go into trial and error, some of the measures that we've taken have not had the immediate impact that we wanted or the exact impact that we wanted. Some have to be corrected to then start again and all suffer all of these setbacks. And then on top of it, we have to add COVID that for two years had a huge impact around the world and had a huge impact in Cuba. We shut down the country for two years and therefore sacrificed for two years, one of the main sources of income, which is tourism. And it coincided with the moment when the US government decided to reinforce its aggression against our country. It, it identified COVID as an ally in its policy against Cuba. We were able to defeat that ally, but we still have the aggression coming from the United States. That's the reality that we face today. And, and I say this with respect. I don't, I'm not trying to offend the United States, not even the government of the United States, but this is a reality, if you want me to be frank, of how we see it and how we interpret today the reality in Cuba. We have today levels of inequality that we didn't have in the past for several reasons. Cuba had been very successful in eliminating that. But the major, uh, an important source of income for some Cubans today is our remittances. The majority of the Cubans that have migrated, are, their color of their skin is white. And therefore it is them who do most of the remitting of money back to Cuba. And that has introduced differences in Cuba that have a color difference. It's not by design, it's not the nature of our system. Quite the contrary, our system is constructed and functions against that. And we hope and we're planning and we're determined to, to overcome those differences. But those are realities that are new to us as a result of alien factors that are being impacting in Cuba today. And those are new challenges challenge that we didn't have in the past. So, because you were very keen on time constraint, I will stop now and maybe engage on questions, whatever. Very good. I want to remind us that we are at the Institute for Policy Studies. There are many uh, areas of interest that we here in the United States have about Cuba. One of the benefits of the normalization of relations that was, a that was established under the administrations of Barack Obama and Raul Castro was the opening of the Cuban embassy. It is here. It is available. Uh, it is reaching out to communities. So for your interest about what's going on in Cuba and the like, you can always contact them. Uh, they have a keen staff, very disciplined and very responsive. I want to underscore the issue of policy and the implications for us as citizens of the United States in focusing on an institution like this, which turns ideas into actions. 
that helps to inform advocacy groups and helps to inform representatives at local, state, and federal levels about foreign policy. What can we do? What must we do uh, in having a, an impact on the US government to get back to that level of the establishment of a normalization of relations? So I'd ask you to think about your brief comments and your brief questions uh, in that context, uh, not in what your far ranging interest in Cuba uh, might be. For those of you who are online, uh, you should not use the chat box, but should speak to the Q&A. Uh, so we're going to take blocks of three uh, brief commentaries or questions at one time uh, so that we can all share of what our multiple interests in activating our citizenship vis-a-vis -vis our policymakers. Uh, I'm going to take the latitude to raise the first question uh, with the Deputy Foreign Minister on what are the prospects? What concretely is going on uh, that we should be aware of, which uh, we might help to build on in engagement with our policymakers? What are the prospects? For the normalization, uh, to get us back to that point of a, a normal course uh, that was established under the administrations that I mentioned. Perhaps a question should be asked to the US government. <laughs> we, we are ready, we, we said it publicly, We've said it officially. We are ready to engage in a relation. And as I, as I just said, we're not saying that the United States needs to correct everything that has been doing against Cuba for us to start a process of improving our relationship. Normalization is, it's, it's a strong word. It's, it's a long, normal, normal. I don't know what normal relation with the United States would be, but, but improving the relationship uh, uh, we are ready. We are, the, the, for us, the easiest thing would be for the government to do what it promised you, the electors, it would do. It would swiftly undo the steps taken by the Trump administration against the relationship with Cuba. That was what's said by the government. Th those will be easy steps. They don't require an act of Congress. It can be done by the president. But again, that question needs to be answered by the by the U.S. government. The floor is open for your questions, comments. I'd like to take blocks of three. Well, let me just say for the questions, I got to give you a signal for the benefit of the people in the room. I have to do some switching technical stuff, so please wait to talk after I give you a signal. Okay. Okay, John McAuliffe, I'm actually a 1968 alumni of IPS. So it's nice to be back in this environment. Um, Minister, Mr. Minister, when the Cardinal came to Havana in February, whenever it was, on behalf of the Pope, he proposed amnesty for July 11 prisoners. Almost immediately, Mr. Nichols, assistant, Secretary of State Nichols said that the US would be happy to accept such people. The US at times has characterized this issue very negatively in terms of we can't even consider doing anything until these prisoners are released. My question is of nuance. Is the US at any point suggesting something positive that might be part of a Cuban response to the papal request what the U.S. would do to get us back to a situation pre-COVID, uh, pre-Trump. I'll take uh, two more in this first block. Other uh, brief commentary or question? Leonardo Flores, I'm also with the Alliance for Cuba Engagement for Respect. And one of the things we've been kind of looking into lately is what the impacts are, the uh, direct economic impacts of the State Department's designation of Cuba as an alleged sponsor of terror, if you could talk about those impacts. The, the impact of what is of, of, yeah, the impacts of on Cuba of the State Department's designation of Cuba as an alleged sponsor. Is there a third question or commentary in this block? Thank you. Um, 
answer, but uh, I'd like to ask uh, you attack by an AR-15 rifle on the Cuban embassy April 30th, 2020. Has the U.S. government let Cuba know anything about any possible prosecution of the man who did it? Which to me is an absolute act of uh, terrorism and the obligation of the United States or any country with the Vienna Convention on the Embassy has been protected. But I just wonder if anything has happened to them. And today, the 25th anniversary of the arrest of the Cuban Fight Hero. We're home free and purposeful. Right. The, first of all, I should say that. The issue of prisoners, we don't identify the issue of prisoners in Cuba or prisoners in the US, which are many, as a bilateral issue. If we were to do that, it would be a very long meeting, just taking into account the amount of people who are in prison in the United States, many of them believing that it's unfair. But I'm not here to talk about the situation in the US. And sentences are long. There are people who believe there are political prisoners some sentences were given last week for acts that they believe were political. So we don't believe that's a bilateral issue in the relationship. And we said so to the government of the United States. The Cardinal expressed a position which is basically a position of the United States. Uh, after his visit, we've spoken to, with the Pope twice directly, our foreign minister last year and our president in June of this year met uh, with the Pope. He is keenly concerned about the relationship, but I wouldn't want to, because he has not done it publicly, to speak on behalf of what the Pope thinks. I think that question should be asked to the Pope uh, on, the, on these issues. Now, the issue of prisoners has been one more excuse. The sonic attacks was, a, was an excuse of the weapons that don't exist. 20, 30, sometimes they used 30,000 Cuban soldiers in Venezuela where it was an excuse. Nobody has able, been able to identify one platoon, one squad in Venezuela, but repeated and repeated all over the place. At some point it was said that Cuba was using the money that came into the country for military purposes. There's no record and the US would have it if we would have bought a, a submarine, a, air, a military aircraft. There's no record of one AK-47 being bought by Cuba. And yet this country that spends a gross amount of money in military spending is accusing Cuba of using its money. So all these are excuses one after the other. So we don't recognize that uh, being an issue. And to respond exactly to the question, the United States has not committed to anything specific when they have spoken about this. It's just something that's raised and there's nothing beyond that. The impact of the list, I mentioned some of it already, but to be exact, this is an arbitrary list. It doesn't have any legitimate recognition. It's just a list made by the State Department without a legitimate recognition internationally or by the United Nations specifically. Yet it has an impact because of the long arm of the US financial sector. So to, just to give you an idea, about a month after we were designated, above all because we were designated 10 days before Biden came into government. And the first days, nothing much happened. But about four weeks after, when there was a government in place and nothing had happened, over 30 institutions, financial and banking institutions of European uh, origin most, not all, with which we had a long lasting relationship, simply cut the relationship. So we can't do business with you anymore because of this. Companies that used to sell to Cuba different equipments or that used to provide services to some of our equipment, of our machinery, of our industry in Cuba, refused to do so. And unfortunately, this happens even in friendly countries because those companies have businesses with the United States regardless of the political view of that friendly government or relationship of that country with Cuba. So it's a, it is something that has an impact on Cuba in every corner. But it goes beyond that. 
as I said a little while ago, one of the main sources of income for Cuba is tourism. By law, when a country is under this list, anyone who visits it has limitations to enter the United States later. So for example, European countries enjoy some, something called ESTA, which is a provision by which they don't require to apply for a visa to enter the United States. Now, if a European, which is a big market for Cuba in terms of tourism, any European who travels to Cuba would then on have to request require a visa, which implies getting into a computer that for many people in itself, that's a, a challenge, paying for the request without guarantee that's being uh, going to be granted and then be exposed at it not being granted. We know of people, there was a recent case of someone from Chile that wanted to go to the United States and was refused entry in the United States because she had traveled to Cuba. And that's someone who was ready to go public on it. We know of hundreds already, plus the many Europeans that simply have refused to travel to Cuba because they say, I travel frequently to the United States or I've never traveled, but I might travel someday. Or I don't even think of traveling, but I might want to join, or my son is moving over there and I can't say that I'm going to never ever travel to the United States again. So that has a huge impact on one main industry of Cuba. So then comes the question, is the aim to protect the safety of Americans for terrorism or is to punish the economy of Cuba and all Cubans which depend of this important industry? And these are the basic impact. It also has an impact in trade in many other areas. It's not just a slander of accusing Cuba of what it's not. It's the direct economic impact. And this is known by the US government. This is, I'm not explaining something that is not known by the US government. And the last one, the, what we know and what we've been told by law enforcement in the United States is that this person is under prosecution. It's, it's a long, the trial began a long time ago. It's taken years and it, it's lagging there. It seems that the individual has, um, it seems some disturbances and therefore it takes time. And what the government has not done is to call this for what it is, a terrorist action. This is an individual with a rifle shooting over 30 rounds, standing in front of an embassy Imagine that happening to any embassy of the United States anywhere in the world, if it would not be considered an act of terrorism. And that happened in the streets of Washington. So let me reframe the question that I raised at the outset. There, there is ongoing dialogue. Your presence here is an example of that. Uh, the embassy here is an example of that. Ongoing dialogue with US policymakers and with US civil society about a US policy towards Cuba, immigration being uh, one of them. The reestablishment of a consular uh, office in the US embassy, the uh, more staffing in the US embassy. How do you assess that? Um, help us understand how that fits into the overall context of the ongoing engagement uh, between representatives of the Cuban government and representatives of the US government. Well First, as you rightly pointed out, we have my migratory agreements and the migration, uh, migratory relations. The implementation of these agreements does not require, but it's much better for both countries when there are offices in the respective capitals. So the US and both Cuba, we've chosen not to dismantle the embassies. The US could do it for political reasons. We could do it just because of how aggressive the US is against it. We chose not to. But there's more things that are occurring. We've had cooperation with on law enforcement. We had a dialogue on terrorism at the beginning of this year on terrorism. U.S. government had a dialogue because they know truly that we have a very strong position against terrorism, that we are effective in law enforcement in the region. We've had dialogue on drug trafficking, on organized crime, on illicit uh, use of, of documentation because the reality is that by its geographical position and the strength and safety of our general reality in Cuba, Cuba is a beacon of protection for the U.S. southeastern border. 
that's a reality from terrorism, from organized crime, from drug trafficking, from alien smuggling, from diseases. That's the reality. So I would interpret, and it's what we that the United States has a natural interest in having this kind of dialogue. It includes we've had dialogue in the area of healthcare, on contagious diseases, on protection of the environment, of protection of the waters that we share in the Gulf of Mexico. And we might continue to have on safety of the ports. And up today, they seem to be the government of the United States ready to engage in these areas. And we are ready to engage in these areas. So that's the nature of what's happening today. If the United States were willing to engage more for the benefit of our, both our peoples or as important for the benefit of other countries, let's say in the area of health, joining forces, the impact of both would be much greater. We could work more, but there has to be a willingness to do that. Other questions or commentary? John. Yeah. Sorry, John Cavana from the Institute for Policy Studies. Wonderful to have you here with us. And also for the decades of trying to get this right. Uh, also to the people in the room for that. I would love to ask a question. Um, you started with that remarkable sentence about policy under Obama and then Trump and the ill of the policy of Trump. I'm curious, you and your ambassador and others here in this room spent a great deal of time making that change under the Obama administration after over 50 years of the US saying no and no and no and no. I'm curious as you think back upon it, on actions both that you took and that people in the United States took in those years of Barack Obama, are there one or two things that led to that change after 50 years? Things that people did that worked and that broke things down so that you could begin the step towards normalization. Anything from that period that we can learn from that we should be doing differently here as we try to get the Biden. But I can't think of one other policy, by the way, where the Biden administration has kept all of the Trump policies or has not attempted to change them. So it is truly outrageous. But part of it I do think is, is inertia. And I'm just curious if there are one or two things in reflecting on that period and others here, because many people in this room spent countless hours helping to change that policy <clears throat> that you think could be helpful for us now. I think you should probably respond to this one. Well, first, uh, our ambassador truly was high, uh, very involved in that process. I fortunately, was what I considered a privilege, I was having a privileged time in South Africa as ambassador. <laughs> that for a Cuban diplomat is a real privilege to be there. If you want to feel loved, be a Cuban in South Africa. <laughs> in, and the, but I, I wouldn't try to identify areas that shouldn't have occurred because times are different. But at the same time, I would say that we don't have to repeat the same. It, in other words, to improve it, we don't have to repeat exactly what happened then. There are different personalities leading each country. The world has changed. The region has changed. Cuba, the, Cuba has changed and the United States has changed. I think this country after and before Trump are different, different places. So I believe that, that it doesn't have to be exactly the same approach. But I'm not in a position to think, maybe Alianis could help me, of that something that we did was wrong. If it was not trusting the future too much, <laughs> thinking that taking these steps would not um, be uh, erasing the way it happened. But I truly, I don't think there's something that, that should be corrected. What I think is that steps can be taken thinking of today and the people who are involved today. And I'm sure that if there is political will, that is for me the, the trick, is we don't have to discover something that is unknown. There's no need to do research on what are these, you know, people that do conflict resolution. It's not that we need to, to it's, it's, it's not a, a riddle that needs to be disentangled. You need political will. If there's political will, we, we can move forward. We've got about 10 minutes. Let's see what's coming online. Yes, I want to thank everybody who is online. We have 70 people with us online. 
I want to start with a action question from Elena. How do you see the role played by Cuban Americans who support the Cuban people and their government but live in the U.S.? Are there any further actions that would help support our brothers and sisters in Cuba other than monthly caravans and donations? Abajo el bloqueo, viva Cuba. Other questions, and sim similarly, um, Mark Friedman also asks, um, Los Angeles hands off Cuba committee and the majority of the US population, like Cuban Americans, are against the blockade. Progressives and unions in the US must take lead in public education, having protests, organizing trips to Cuba, et cetera. What are other ways we can help? And so one, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I was gonna ask you, you know, the Cuban vaccine has been really the great untold story how Cuba has really basically conquered COVID. Nobody's died from COVID for the past year in Cuba, as far as I know. And you're having single digit infections. I mean, these vaccines seem to be much safer, much more effective, and we can't get them here. You know, I have to wear a mask, you know. But, uh, you know, so I was wondering, you know, I mean, the Finley Institute has done tremendous research, there's tremendous biotechnology resources. They have some manufacturing issues, like you mentioned, because you can't get the equipment, you can't get the equipment you need to really be up to our GMP levels. But uh, I mean, what's being done to really tell that story that? You know, it's been a tremendous success in COVID. You know, Cuba is the only country that has really conquered COVID. Right. Yes. Um, first of all, I should say that we have a great admiration and consideration for all those people, Cubans, either Cubans that were born in Cuba or people that were born in the United States or other parts of the world that considered themselves Cubans, that constantly struggle to try to have a better relationship with their country of origin and to counter a policy that they see as transparently unfair and that is making our, our people hurt. Now, I think as a government, we have to be humble in recommending or requesting what they should do because some of them go at great risks in, in carrying out what they do. Some of them do a lot of sacrifice and spend a lot of time in, in doing it. And what we feel is a great level of appreciation and admiration for what they're doing. For them, there's also an additional burden, is the fact that many times these policies are claimed to be on their behalf. There are politicians that speak on behalf of Cubans who live in the United States, misrepresenting the feeling and the understanding. Many of them that talk to us privately in Cuba, they say, well, I see that, but who represents me? Who speaks for us in the United States? And many times it's themselves who are doing this. And to a great extent, a similar sentiment goes to many of those in the United States. I would say out in other parts of the world who have an active role, and we see it year after year in trying to to see that their government and their country has a, a, a more benign policy uh, towards Cuba that would welcome a friendly relationship with a country that wants to be friendly with the United States. And again, it is very difficult for us to come and, and preach or, 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 or convey advice of what is it that we should be saying. And I want to be very careful uh, in not trying to, to, to give recommendations of what should be done, but at the same time, convey our admiration and our respect for what they do. Now, we try to make as much sound as possible with vaccines uh, in our limited capacity. Several scientific uh, journals, some of them of the most recognized around the world, have published papers uh reflecting that and expressing it but the media chooses to ignore it to give you an idea we were have we were already successfully vaccinating our people and whoever followed the curves of both of of, of death and, and uh, con cont contagion contagion is what yeah. in cuba contagious. could have contagious could have seen that it was dropping as a result of the vaccine and then we received an offer 
from the US government of sending us vaccines with a, a whole set of preconditions for us to accept it. And we thought it was a joke. What, you're offering to vaccinate a country that is already vaccinating? It's like now they're offering internet to a country that already has access to internet. And it's true that it took us a long time to incorporate internet, but today, according to international data, Cuba has a higher level of internet penetration than the average of Latin America and the Caribbean today. And yet you still see sometimes the people that they want to provide internet uh, for Cubans. So we don't know what to do to make the story better known. What we know how to do is to vaccinate, that we do. <laughs> It's 427. Um, she's the one, the whoopee. Okay. <laughs> so we're still on the 430 hard stop. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, uh, we've got less than three minutes. And um, I, okay, if we can take very quickly, at least to get you on the register and uh, have him respond to this last round. Yes, sir. I was going to give an announcement. Oh, you guys are from One question from the chat. Um, Roberto mentions Cuba has offered to send medical teams to the US to help after Katrina. The US refused that offer. Has Cuba given similar offers to the US in other crises? Uh, yes. Okay. During, oh, should I answer that? Yes, yes, please. Oh, oh, I, I know several examples, we'll give you one. On September 11, 2001, when the Twin Towers and the Pentagon were, were attacked, the United States said that planes could not land. It was thrown away. And we immediately opened our, our skies and we said, we are ready to receive aircraft from the United States immediately. All you have to do is inform and the country is ready for that. If there are victims in any of the places attacks that require blood, plasma, or medical personnel, we are ready to provide. Uh, it was just an offer, no obligation. It wasn't accepted or it wasn't uh, taken, but we offered both. Okay. And the they could overfly Cuba if they were going to another destination in the region. It wasn't accepted. So on behalf of IPS, um, all of our sponsors, uh, the people from across the country online, um, I wanna thank Ambassador Dan Torres, uh, as, as well as Deputy Foreign Minister uh, Ocasio, who have joined us uh, to talk about uh, policy towards normalization. Let me conclude with this, picking up on the comments that uh, were last raised about us as US citizens. Over the last decade or more, the entire world as reflected in the United Nations, except for two countries have said an effect that the United States is a rogue government standing outside of the normalization process in which countries over many, many decades have come together to find mutual interest and to determine how to handle their differences with respect and in peace. I think it's very important that we take this to heart, that the people that we elect uh, to govern not only internally, but on our behalf internationally, stand outside of the protocols of the entire world. We're in a moment in which there is great flux going on in the world, new alignments of sovereignty, self-determination and independence, very messy, very contradictory, but yet, the whole of our hemisphere, with the exception of the United States and Canada, have come together in the community of Latin American and Caribbean nations as a zone of respect and peace. 
they vary widely in their ideological and political identifications, but all of them consistently embrace the importance of a respectful and beneficial engagement with Cuba. The question before us uh, in this season uh, in which we ritually uh, move to talk about democracy uh, and to identifying those people that we want to represent us uh, with certain principles and certain policy platforms, for us to consider how do we intensify our role in joining uh, the world community of citizens and nations in saying and demanding from our government that we want to join in the family of nations and this respectful, mutually beneficial relationship with Cuba. So as has been said, it is on us, the citizens, I wanna thank again, the citizen uh, advocacy organizations that have come together with the Institute for Policy Studies uh, to bring us uh, this opportunity to uh, have a dialogue with the foreign minister. There is much work to be done. Uh, let's go out and inform US policy such that we become a full part of the global development of the engagement of Cuba. Thank you. 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 Thank you.